The Titan I nuclear bunker complex was the largest secretive underground complex of its time and still remains America's most hardened underground structure. Construction for the Titan I commenced in 1959. It was designed as a virtual underground city with independent power for 17 buildings and domes up to 165 feet deep, 35 millions of gallons of annual water allocation, sewer, kitchen, bathrooms, sleeping quarters with chemical, biological, and nuclear air filtration. Over 600,000 cubic yards of earth were removed in the facility's construction. 32,000 cubic yards of epoxy polymer modified concrete rated it up to 15,000 PSI. 300 tons of piping, 90 miles of cables, 300 ton of 3-inch rebar, and a labyrinth of 2,500 feet of expansive tunnels. Each Titan I nuclear bunker complex cost the American taxpayers a total of $47 million to build in 1962 dollars. Indexed to inflation, the replacement value of a Titan I nuclear bunker complex today would be over $350 million. The size of the complex was about 900 by 1600 feet, or roughly 34 acres. It consisted of three missile launchers, launch control center, powerhouse and antenna silos supported by a network of underground fuel storage tanks, radar, equipment terminals all interconnected by tunnels. The launch complex was an underground hardened site intended to withstand all but a direct hit from an incoming nuclear weapon. All structures were of steel reinforced concrete construction and were placed underground. All entrances were sealed with concrete hatches up to five foot thick. It was, one writer noted, among the safest places on earth. Entrance was through a portal sealed by a hydraulically operated concrete hatch into a 70 foot deep shaft with a freight elevator. The Titan I complexes were extremely complex, wrote Major General W.A. Davis. The missile silo elevator system alone incorporated about 300,000 parts. Groundbreaking ceremonies on the 5th of May, 1959, proved inauspicious when a sudden spring snowstorm blanketed the Denver Titan I sites. The automobile cavalcade of dignitaries became stuck in mud as they approached one of the sites. In addition, construction workers had walked out over a wage dispute, leaving all equipment idle. Another problem arose when ground was broken at another nearby Titan I site as workers uncovered fragments of military ordnance left from a 1940s bombing range. Demolition crews did a sweep of all nearby Titan I sites and over the next month cleared a variety of hazardous munitions as well as several tons of scrap metal. Although the entire complex was underground, it was built above ground. The primary building sites for the command center, powerhouse, and the three silo areas were excavated, while the connecting tunnels were trenched. Once construction was complete, the complex was backfilled with up to 25 feet of earth. Work began with the construction of hall and access roads to the area. The access road was typically a two-lane asphalt concrete pavement. Construction began with an open-cut excavation down to a depth of 60 feet, the level of the launch control center floor. From there, the missile silo was mined to its final 165-foot depth using pneumatic tools such as an air-powered mucker. The soil varied between Titan I construction sites. Some crews encountered heavy basalt under the subsurface, requiring drilling and blasting. During these operations, the contractors supported the silo walls with steel beams, wire mesh lagging, and sprayed on concrete. The Denver Titan I complexes were built concurrently with similar crews, equipment, and materials. At its peak, Morrison Knudsen and associate contractors employed nearly 3,500 workers. Construction was continually delayed by a constant stream of upper management change orders. 
These were hardly unexpected, though, given that plans and specifications were not complete when the contracts were awarded and the complex itself was still undergoing its first testing program. The missile silos, for example, were cut open to an approximate depth of 35 feet below ground level but excavation progressed slowly due to the sand, seepage, and even low-grade coal. This proved to be a recurring problem with tunnel settlement resulting in shifts as much as 10 inches and damage to floors, seals, and joints. Most Denver Titan I sites were also plagued by a rattlesnake infestation, which was a hazard for construction workers. These difficulties were all faced with little alteration to the expected completion date, which had been set as a matter of national defense policy. As one COE official stated, everything is coordinated to a date that is part of a master plan to defend the United States. At the Lowry Denver sites, two 10-hour shifts a day was standard protocol, with additional shifts added after February 1961. As the scheduled completion date neared, the pace quickened. Some of the heroics are almost unbelievable, said Vernon Rawlings, a site activation manager. Men working 24 hours and 36 hours at a stretch, without sleep. Men staying on the job two weeks at a time, catching a few hours of sleep now and again. Workers disregarding their own safety to make last minute corrections. Construction was finished by the fall of 1961. At that point, the Martin Company installed the missile and the missile's support system. At the end of installation and checkout, the contractor had to demonstrate the site, a technical acceptance demonstration. During the following six months, the 451st Wing conducted on-site testing and training for its squadrons, culminating in test launches. By the spring of 1962, the Lowry sites were ready to be activated. At a formal ceremony at one site with three missiles standing in the background, General Bernard A. Shriver handed a symbolic key to General Thomas Power of the Strategic Air Command. All 12 missiles were finally lowered into their silo cribs at the Lowry sites.